Seeing no further introductions, it's therefore time for member statements. The member from Dufferin Calvin. Speaker, it's my pleasure to welcome representatives from the Schizophrenia Society of Ontario to Queen's Park today. The Schizophrenia Society of Ontario is Ontario's largest not-for-profit charitable health organization supporting those impacted by schizophrenia and psychosis. Schizophrenia is a serious but treatable mental illness. The seriousness of schizophrenia is underscored by the fact that the lifetime risk of suicide among people with schizophrenia is between 4 and 10 percent. SSO plays a crucial part in treatment for those affected by schizophrenia by providing programming and services which seek to help families, caregivers and individuals dealing with schizophrenia reduce stigma and increase education on schizophrenia. Nearly eight years ago, during the Select Committee on Mental Health and Addiction, members from all three parties heard testimony from the Schizophrenia Society of Ontario. The issues they raised then, like system capacity and coordination, access to treatment and lengthy wait times, are still a problem in Ontario for those looking for mental health treatment. However, the efforts of organizations like Schizophrenia SSO can be seen in that it is essentially a political consensus in the province of Ontario that there needs to be more money and better service for those with families and individuals dealing with mental illness. I congratulate the Schizophrenia Society of Ontario on their ongoing work advocating for and working with those affected by schizophrenia. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. From Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. For far too long, the people of Hamilton Mountain, like others all across Ontario, have had to endure a steady decline in their health care services, whether that's in hospitals, in long-term care, or in home care. They've seen our schools fall into disrepair and staff being cut, especially in special education. They've had to struggle to pay their bills as hydro rates increased and child care costs went through the roof. Those who, without benefits plans, have had to find money to pay for their dental and to fill the prescriptions that they need to get healthy. Sadly, far too many have had no choice but to do without. They've watched their kids suffer when they can't get the mental health services that they need. They've had to fight tooth and nail for the services that their kids need with, for autism and developmental disabilities. That's the legacy of this Liberal government and the Conservatives before them. Yesterday, as our leader, Andrew Horvath, announced our NDP platform, I witnessed a declaration of hope and confidence for Ontario's future, a positive message that we don't need to settle anymore, that we can do better. We don't need to keep switching between bad or worse. In just seven weeks, Ontarians will elect a new government, and I'm proud that in this election, they will have a choice of who will represent them next. They can make Thank a change you. for the better. Further member statements, the member from Beaches, East York. Well, thank you, Speaker, and it's a pleasure for me to rise today and talk about a very important investment that this government made yesterday into the expansion and modernization of the Mondelez Canada's Peak Freens plant in my riding of Beaches, East York. Wow. Since 1950s, Peak Freens plant on O'Connor Drive supported Ontario wheat farmers and numerous ingredient suppliers. In addition, the Peak Freens plant has been a significant employer in the area, running around the clock and producing some of the most popular cookies being made in the world, like Fudgeos, Oreos, and chips. Ahoy, and all speaker in a nut-free environment. You just drive by this plant and you can smell the goodness. The 22.6 million investment we announced through Ontario's Job and Prosperity Fund will allow Mondelez to expand production, plant, install two new bakery lines, upgrade an existing bakery line, and produce new products like the Oreo Thins that they developed at the plant two years ago. Overall, some $130 million is spent on the expansion so that every $1 we're investing, they're putting in five. So in my community, this means supporting and enhancing over 450 jobs, as well as supporting all the local businesses who serve the company and its employees. And in the words of plant manager Juan Carlos Rodriguez, this investment helps us progress on our journey towards manufacturing excellence, ensuring our products can continue to be made in the province of Ontario. Sir Speaker, with this type of strategic investment, we create fairness and opportunity during a period of rapid economic change. Investments like these continue to ensure global companies like Mondelez can continue 
right here in Ontario's economy. Thank you. Thank you for the member statements. The member from Huron, Bruce. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I had the opportunity to attend the opening exhibit event for the Hallmarks of Humanity quilt exhibit at the Bruce County Museum and Cultural Centre. And let me tell you, Speaker, the exhibit was amazing. I appreciated the quilts and, more importantly, the stories that were on display. And I thoroughly appreciated the era and the sense of community that they represented. The history was breathtaking. Back in the 19th century, quilts were often used to fundraise for charitable causes. And later, in the 20th century, during war times, the Red Cross had volunteers work on quilts, which were sent overseas to comfort soldiers and injured members of the military. The names of the people who worked on the quilt were embroidered onto the face, which makes the legacy of each and every quilt so special. There's a particular quilt that was on display, the Carl Ross quilt, and it was made by people from the Teeswater area. And I have to tell you, it's the feature quilt in this particular exhibit, and it was sent to England in 1918. Some of the names that have been stitched lovingly onto that quilt were Collison, Donaldson, Cassidy, Hollenby, Armstrong, Pennington, Milliton, I should say Millen, Grant, Gillies, and of course Thompson, just to name a few. And uh, seriously, Speaker, all the names I just mentioned, plus so many more, continue to proudly call Teeswater home. The hallmarks of humanity show that good things really can come from rural Ontario, and I'm so proud to be part of that. Thank you very Thank much. You. Member Stavis, the member from London, Thank you, Speaker. Today, I would like to share an event that happened in London, and it had London rockin'. This past Sunday, an annual Jack Richardson London Music Awards honoured local talent and paid tribute to influential local artists. The not-for-profit Jack Richardson Music Awards are a regional music incubator who aim to preserve the rich music history of our region. The awards serve as a way to recognize and celebrate the music makers of today, encourage a new generation of musicians. Part of the celebrations also include new dectees to the Jack Richardson London Music Hall of Fame, honoring outstanding musicians from London. I was excited and proud to attend this event and to celebrate with so many talented individuals and groups from our city. I am incredibly proud of the hometown talent we have in London. They have worked incredibly hard for their success. There is a special atmosphere at events like this, when the hard work and sacrifice come together and you are honoured by your peers in your own hometown community. These artists are telling the stories of our city in their music, sharing their voices with the world, and I'd like to thank them for that. I would also like to thank the Jack Richardson London Music Awards for providing the opportunity to highlight local performers for their contributions to the music and to our community. It is so important that we provide all artists of any medium a platform for expression and encouragement. They they are the storytellers and record recorders of our past, present, and future, and it was a rockin' good time. Thank you for the member statements. The member from uh, Etobicoke Centre. Thanks very much, Speaker. Speaker, my grandparents immigrated to Canada from Eastern Europe after World War II. They were not Polish, but they, like so many Poles, faced tremendous oppression under the Soviet Union. My grandmother faced persecution, lived through a genocide, and three of her brothers were killed by the Soviet secret police. What upset my grandmother was not just the horror of these crimes, but that the truth was never told that, or was officially covered up, that justice, justice to the victim's memory was never done. The Katyn massacre was one of those crimes. In April and May 1940, over 20,000 Polish citizens were brutally murdered in an act of genocide by the NKVD on Stalin's order. The victims were mainly reserve officers, but also civilians. They were the flower of the Polish nation, and the intent was clear. Stalin wanted to decapitate the Polish nation. Katyn was a forbidden topic until the fall of communism, and to this day, it remains a deep historical wound for Poles and for Polish communities around the world. In 2010, while traveling to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the Katyn massacre, 96 people, including Polish President Lech Kaczynski, lost their lives in a tragic plane crash. On that day, a second beheading of Poland took place close to Katyn. These two tragedies will forever be linked. Last week, Speaker, I introduced a motion calling on this legislature to condemn the Katyn massacre as an act of genocide carried out against the Polish nation. By introducing this motion, it is my hope that we can do what my grandmother would have wanted, what Poles in Polonia have been fighting for for so long, that accountability is brought to bear on the Soviet perpetrators, that the truth is told, and that the utmost justice to the victim's memory is done. Let us honour their memory. Cześć ich pamięci. 
Thank you. For the member statements, the member from Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And today is Yom Hazikaron when we remember the members of the Israeli Defense Forces who sacrificed their lives, as well as all the victims of terrorist attacks. But we should also remember the 11 Canadian members of Machal, which is a Hebrew acronym for volunteers from abroad who gave their lives in the 1948. And of course, not all of them were Jewish. We had George Buzz Burling to remember from Verdun, Quebec. Harvey Cohen and Ed Lugetsch from Toronto, and they were two first cousins. Ruben Schiff and Sidney Rubinoff and Sidney Leisure from Toronto. Leonard Fitchett from Vancouver. Ralph Moster of Vancouver as well. And Wilfred Cantor, a pilot from Toronto. Willie Fisher, a navigator from Winnipeg. And Fred Stevenson, a co-pilot from Vancouver. Tonight at Beth Sedek Synagogue here in Toronto. The Israeli consulate is going to be hosting a memorial event that I will be at, as well as uh, uh, Mr. Cole from the um, government side and James Pasternak, a city councillor from Toronto. Um, and this Thursday, there's going to be the flag raising here at Queen's Park with the Israeli consulate. It's 70 years, so big celebration this <coughs> year uh, to celebrate 70 years since the Israeli War of Independence and all the accomplishments that we enjoy here today with our smartphones, which sometimes get taken away from us, and all the technology and all the innovation. So I look forward to seeing many of the members here from the legislature um, this Thursday. Hopefully the weather's improving and winter has finally left us um, and that we don't have to go to Israel to finally see some sun. Um, Israel Chai. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker, and I rise today to welcome the Schizophrenia Society of Ontario to Queen's Park. I know several members met with some other group this morning and had some great conversations about the great work that they do. For almost 40 years now, the Schizophrenia Society of Ontario has been our province's largest not-for-profit health organization that supports individuals, families and communities impacted by schizophrenia and psychosis. Schizophrenia affects one in 100 people and occurs equally in men and women. It does not discriminate. Individuals with schizophrenia can experience psychotic episodes, such as delusions. They can experience profound disruptions in their thinking, the way they perceive the world, and their sense of self. While a cure for schizophrenia has not yet been found, we know that with the right supports, schizophrenia is treatable. That is why our government is making an unprecedented investment in mental health and addictions that will improve care for those who experience mental health challenges in their lifetime, such as schizophrenia. In our recent budget, we announced the largest investment in Canadian history in mental health and addiction services, a four-year investment of $2.1 billion that will reframe the system to deliver more accessible and better integrated care. Despite the great work of the Schizophrenia Society, this condition is still severely stigmatized and feared, and we need to work closely with groups like the Schizophrenia Society of Ontario to eliminate the social stigma surrounding mental illness. I'm delighted to welcome to the House today CEO Mary Alberti, members of the Board of Directors George Biloff and Manish Dama, and mental health advocate and member of the Society Speakers Bureau Chris Whitaker. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Further member statements. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you, Speaker. I rise today to speak about the dioceses of Pembroke and other faith communities' call for conscience. Letter writing campaign, which has resulted in much correspondence making its way to me over the past several weeks. These constituents have ongoing concerns with the impact of Bill 84, Medical Assistance in Dying Statute Law Amendment Act 2017, which was passed by the Liberals last year. They believe, as I do, that there should be a right to conscience for healthcare workers when it comes to medical assistance in dying or MAID, which the current legislation does not allow for. They also highlighted the lack of access to quality palliative care here in Ontario. That is why I and my caucus colleagues voted against Bill 84 last year when the provincial Liberals refused to include our amendment that would, would have provided for conscience rights. I strongly believe that had the government adopted the legislation similar to what is found in Alberta, Ontario's patients would still be able to access made services while health care workers could maintain their right not to participate due to ethical or religious concerns. I want to thank my constituents again for taking the time to write about this important issue and call on the government to address their concerns regarding conscience rights for health care workers and the shortage of quality palliative care here in the province of Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. I thank all members. Um, I wanted to add a little message of my own, if uh, you will indulge me slightly. Um, all of you are aware of the very famous Boston Marathon. 
Well, one of Brantford's very own, who lives in Brantford, Kristen Duchesne, at 41 years old, came in third place in the, women's, in the entire women's division. She de dedicated her run to the memory of the Hobolt victims and their families. An Olympian in the Rio Games in 2016, she has always demonstrated an amazing spirit, dedication, determination, passion, and love of what she does, seldom ever seen. She's an amazing athlete, an amazing woman, amazing mother, amazing wife, and she carries the plate and three screws in her hip to remind her anything is possible. Congrats to Christine Deshane of Brantford, Stratford, Ontario, and Canada are proud of you. Thank you for your indulgence. It is now reports by committees.